Good afternoon. Thank you for inviting me to talk to the Cancer Symposium this afternoon. I'm Dr. Christopher Kearney. I'm uh, the palliative care director at MedStar Franklin Square Hospital and the former uh, director for MedStar Health Palliative Care. I um, would look forward to the opportunity to talk this afternoon. And if you're on YouTube, please log in and submit questions in the chat box and we will do our best to answer in real time. The topic, unsurprisingly, palliative care in a comprehensive uh, cancer program uh, is close to my heart and I'm looking forward to talking about it. We hope uh, during the talk uh, this afternoon at least to mention uh, what Dr. Faha has asked me to talk about, which is the indications for palliative care consultation, timing, and possibly benefits for palliative care in uh, general oncology care. So going back in history about eight years to 2012, ASCO uh, did a um, a position statement or clinical practice guidelines which said that integration of palliative care in standard oncology would be recommended for all patients with advanced stage cancer and it would be provided ideally by a multidisciplinary team. They uh, suggested that ideally again that that care would be provided within a reasonably short period of time of these diagnoses of advanced cancer. And I would comment on that early on to say uh, that any of us, if we ourselves were presented with a advanced cancer diagnosis, the moment that happened to us, the world would change. Everything about us would change. And it wouldn't just be the tumor or the possible treatment programs. It would be all the other human factors which come under attack, so to speak, and therefore possibly uh, the justification for a broader look at our care in comprehensive cancer program. Finally, there is evidence now growing in the, in the early studies, uh, the TEML study that most of us are familiar with uh, compared uh, metastatic non-small cell lung cancers with usual care versus usual care plus palliative care. And the study showed that there were some benefits in the more psychosocial range, less depression or anxiety. But the thing that caught everyone's attention was that the patients who received the palliative care plus usual care lived longer in the, in the range of three months longer than the cohort in usual care. So that was in some ways sort of like a new drug. So why though do I have to tell you or why do we have to talk about this topic? One that is probably very familiar to most of you already. Uh, oncologists provide palliative care and have for since the beginning. Um, it's part of routine care that your patients do not spend all their time dying of their disease. Most of them are living well with their disease. So why does palliative care have to be part of the format? This is a true uh, sense from most patients that they prefer their doctors to be optimistic. They like to hear about hope. They don't like negativity so much. And palliative care in some ways sounds negative to our patients and to their families. And even among oncology colleagues, it has a negative connotation. In some places, they've even changed the name from palliative care to supportive care services with reasonable thinking behind that. Um, there is this uh, argument as well that these discussions are quite time consuming. Many of you are in busy practices where your time is tight and you would worry about dropping down a rabbit hole 
with long conversations uh, about issues, many of which are not actually directly medical or oncological. So reasons why we don't really need to pursue this dialogue about palliative care in your world. However, these are the other issues that you're also very well aware of. So your patients are often seriously ill, at least at time during their treatment program. They have uh, long clinical courses often, and at least part of the time there it can be a significant symptom burden. They can have significant psychosocial uh, symptoms. They certainly have uh, financial issues often, and, and of course even spiritual issues, all of which impact how they are doing, how they, how they feel, how they are cared for. The tenets of, of, of uh, oncology care is that they have to be able to tolerate your therapy to start with or it's a no-go, but the tumor also then has to respond to your treatment plan to get ongoing success. The, the other question that you're all familiar with, of course, is what their functional status was before they started out uh, in your care, what their comorbidities are. And then this other issue of all of those issues above, financial, spiritual, psychosocial, will play a factor in their ability to adhere, their ability to stay with the program and be successful. So all of these are part of your world every day with these patients. A lot to ask from one practitioner. So this multidisciplinary approach has been advocated for years in oncology. This statement actually was heisted uh, from Tom Finucane down at Bayview and still one of my favorites. So um, how gravely ill becomes dying and why it's difficult. And this statement I still use regularly, the widespread and deeply held desire not to be dead is actually still universal among our patients almost at any age and at any stage of their disease. So in my work, I recognize that. I know most people still want to stick around whatever chance they may have. Our second challenge is our, maybe not inability, but our, our, um, our, our, our not precise ability to foretell what's going to happen in the future in terms of prognosis, and we'll talk about that more in a little bit. And then if, um, Another quote uh, stolen from Funigan, if death is the only choice, many patients who have only a small amount of hope will pay a pretty high price uh, to continue that struggle. And you see that uh, regularly in your practices. Similarly, why is this work so complicated for you and for your palliative care colleagues? Um, the concept of short versus long-term prognosis in general, we aren't so bad in longer term prognosis. Most of you have a very good idea, likely, of how long your patients may live in ranges of years. However, when you get closer to the short term, it becomes much more difficult and, and much less reliable in cancer as with many other uh, diseases. So it hampers our ability to accurately guide our patients in some ways. We um, are also, uh, as our patients progress in their illness, um, for many reasons, often relying on their, their designated surrogate decision makers. And those um, are, are always part of the health care of our cancer patients and our palliative patients. They may or may not, however, have a very accurate view of what the patient uh, themselves would want or understands. There's plenty of evidence that in some studies, at least, the surrogate is not right many more times than the flip of a coin in terms of knowing what their mother or their father or their brother really wants, given the overall circumstances. The world we live in uh, has expectations. Our organizations uh, and your organization uh, certainly has expectations of quality metrics and, and guidelines about what care you provide uh, to your seriously ill patients. That um, this is a, a last point that we'll come back to a little bit. As you probably know, most of palliative work in the United States still remains within the hospital confines. 
there is a strong movement and much energy into moving palliative care out into the community. But at this point, we are still fairly hospital bound. And, uh, uh, and as you will see, there are many patients uh, there that uh, are your patients as well. The surprise question has been around for some years. This was Joanne Lynn down at uh, George Washington saying, uh, giving someone an idea of who might need palliative care. And, and she didn't say, do you know that your patient may only have six months or less to live? But rather, would you be surprised if the patient you're caring for now becomes seriously ill or dies in the next six months? If the answer is no, then we all, I think, are responsible to consider our duties caring for a patient whose time may be short. What, are the, what is the totality of care they need that uh, would be involved in that, time, in that time frame? It opens the door, in my mind, to be uh, for us to think more widely about our patient's care uh, hospice, uh, as you know, requires someone to say they may only live six months and it's a limiting factor. But for palliative, I think it, it, it allows you to think more broadly about the patient's needs as you're caring for them on their journey. So no palliative care talk in the world was ever given without showing this diagram, uh, usual care. So the, this is a, the, the former you make a diagnosis of advanced cancer, stage four, three or four cancer, you will treat until um, there is no further benefit seen, and then there's nothing left to do, you would turn them over to your, your palliative or, or hospice uh, colleagues. Um, a better version in almost everyone's mind now would look more like this, where even at diagnosis, there will be palliative needs for these patients. As I mentioned before, when you get your diagnosis, you will see that yourselves. And the idea that palliative care could be linked into comprehensive uh, cancer care, meaning you are treating them with chemotherapy, radiation, and surgery, yet on the side, there is a palliative care a partnership traveling along with you, they have fewer palliative needs in the beginning, but as their disease progresses, they may have more. Ultimately, the idea would be if you got to the point where there was no further treatment available, useful or beneficial to the patient, that your palliative colleagues would have already been alongside you. You, you wouldn't be giving up or, or leaving them. You would be handing them over uh, to continue the comprehensive care that you've hoped they'd have from the beginning. Prognosis, I'm, I'm coming back to because I think it is at the heart of uh, where we are, this statement about how we um, in some ways have gotten, in the old days, I guess maybe we would not have much in the way of diagnostics. We weren't very good in therapeutics, so the job of doctors was to sit at the bedside, hold someone's pulse, and say how long they might think they have. And that was a useful thing that doctors did. Well, as we've progressed in, in the world into diagnostics and therapeutics, uh, some people would say our at we've atrophied our prognostic skills, and, and so now we don't uh, step up to the plate in the same way, giving people prognostic information. So, for instance, this is a study that was uh, done out of Chicago a few years back. Nick Christakis, uh, as you note, takes care, is talking about hospice patients. So the diagnosis is actually already in for these patients. There's not any uncertainty. They've already enrolled. And there's a lot of them, 300 plus patients, and a lot of different doctors involved in his study. So what he did was he asked the doctors involved in, in certifying these patients for hospice, how many days they thought their patient would actually live. And, and the um, doctor said on average around 75. He then uh, said, what would you, are you telling your patients or, the fa or their families? And they would say, well, it'd be better to say 90 because that sounds better than 75. It just gives them more hope. And then, then as he showed in his study, the actual survival was, was less than a, than a quarter or a third of what they uh, had uh, you know, predicted. And 
so it, um, it gives you these statements, which would worry us as doctors, so that we would, we would never believe that we weren't trying to give frank information or giving inaccurate information. And then there was this a pattern of giving no prognostic inf information, meaning only God knows kind of answer. And that's, um, that uh, is what his, his study showed us, and, and many of us think that might be problematic. Um, so the other argument, though, often is if we just stay positive, our patients will do better. So um, I would think of it this way or do think of it this way, that, that in any group, a spectrum of patients that we're taking care of, uh, there are going to be a variety of, of different ways of looking at life. Some people are going to say, I will t do anything you say. I want to stay alive no matter what. And if you have a 34-year-old woman with breast cancer who's dying and two small children, she is going to stay in there no matter what. Other patients have quite different views about how they would want to spend their valuable time. Um, I think, and you would probably know, that if you give them realistic information that people will then make their own judgments about how they spend their time. I would uh, briefly segue to say how I got into palliative medicine from a primary geriatric work that I've been doing for years was work on an ethics committee in that I, when I got called in, it sounded like there was a pattern that we as the healthcare system weren't really telling our patients the whole story. And it got to be, in my mind, if we were, if we were telling them the real story, a percentage of those patients would have made a different decision. They may not have been in hospital. They may have been home on their porch or spending their time in a different way. So I, I started to get this feeling that if we're not really being forthright or honest with our prognostic information in ways we're actually cheating our patients. I think they have the right to hear from us. Now, uh, uh, when in teaching residents and students and, and even working with the hospitalists, people will, will say, don't, whatever you do, don't tell the patient their diagnosis or their prognosis because they will roll over and die, which I, I don't think anyone's ever done, period. But um, I, I think the right solution to that problem when I'm teaching is to say well, the patient always has the right to be asked what they want to know and if they tell us they want straight information about the prognosis for their diagnosis then then you're going to give it to them. Some families or uh, patients will say they don't want you to talk to them directly, talk to my daughter or perhaps uh, you know um, talk with both of us together. So that would be the uh, to me the answer to that uh, don't tell them they won't be able to tolerate the news. But I still think you're obligated to uh, make that effort to get prognostic information out for patients to make their own decisions about how to spend their time. So as all of us know, the hospital is a, is a way stop for many of our advanced cancer patients somewhere in their hospitalizations, uh, somewhere in their treatment course. And this is rather notable that this many patients spend time in the hospital. And the ICU is certainly a, a, not an uncommon stopping point. Often a question, if you're on the hospital side, which is where I am most of the time, you wonder when you see a metastatic cancer patient in the ICU how, how that came about and could we do better? You know, what's the likelihood they're going to benefit from the intensive care unit at this point in their trajectory? So I, I consider this, I, this is sort of a challenge, I think, to all of us, but um, I, I wonder, uh, Sharp uh, Healthcare uh, owns their patients. They're, they're a large HMO in Southern California, but they make this claim in their oncology program that zero, zero percent of their advanced cancer patients uh, are cared for in an acute care hospital. That's pretty stunning. Um, I, it's, it's always gotten me interested in how they do that. It's a very aggressive program they have for outpatient, community-based, office-based, combination of oncology, palliative care, community workers, home health services. 
they've realized the benefit, obviously, because they've saved money doing it by keeping their patients out of the hospital. But as many of us would know, most of these patients are not well served in the hospital. It's unwanted for most of them. It it would be, uh, they would be grateful if they weren't in our hospitals generally. Uh, at this point, uh, there's no way around it. MedStar Health is not able to provide that kind of intervention for our oncology and from our oncology and palliative care programs. Um, I, I do wonder, seeing as I spend my day now here at Franklin Square Hospital, often seeing oncology patients, if there weren't very many of them, would that leave me more bandwidth with my team to go out the door and see patients in your offices or do the community-based version of, of palliative care? Yes, the answer would be yes, and I hope it's the direction we're, we're working towards. I know many of you support this already. Mr. P is um, a cancer patient admitted to this hospital. He actually back in December of uh, 2019 diagnosed with two tumors, two cancers, uh, both a large and a small cell cancer, has actually been very successfully treated for nine months, presents um, ultimately to the emergency room feeling poorly with back pain. He's found to have a pneumonia, but uh, more um, to the point, uh, imaging shows widespread disease, bony mets in the spine, liver mets, brain mets, lung involvement. So he's probably run out of um, good fortune in terms of one of his tumors. Um, and he is now admitted to hospital for treatment. Um, I guess um, he's, he's symptomatic, unsurprisingly, uh, an area where palliative care and oncology overlap often, um, I hope, you know, co collaboratively, that um, he has certainly other symptoms uh, that are uh, notable when you meet the patient. He's actually fairly angry um, at, at being in hospital. And um, I had the opportunity, I guess, thinking of all the people that are working with him, he's under the care of a hospitalist, he has a pulmonary consultation, there's nursing, the usual array of hospital care. But uh, I asked him what he's been told about his condition, and he basically says, I have pneumonia. I said, has anybody told you anything else? And he, he says, no. And I then said, well, there is more information. How do you like your information? Can I, should I be talking with you, or should I wait and talk with family members and you? He said, no, tell me. So I. Uh, had to give him at least some details of what these CAT scans were showing and explain to him why his back was hurting uh, so mightily with uh, a lot of cancer now in his back. It was news to him and it was taken, mm, I would say, not uh, uh, easily by him. Um, however, um, I had to say to him I thought he had uh, the right to know what we were worried about and that how we would now work together to try to continue to treat him. So I, I guess the, the, the reason I'm bringing it up is there wouldn't be uh, totally unusual uh, for a patient to wind up in hospital with a deterioration of their overall condition. Um, wh what are we telling them when they arrive here? Um, what is the family knowing? And then how is that compared to what we're actually talking about at the nurse's station or, or back in our, in, our, uh, in our own offices about the situation. Um, you know, there's, a, there's obviously a, probably a disconnect. And in these cases, always, for me as a palliative care physician, I really uh, always prefer to have my oncology colleagues with me. I like to be able to say I've talked with my oncology colleagues about what the next steps are, and obviously, to the extent possible, uh, have you come join us for care for these patients in the hospital. The um, trust issue I, I put down at the bottom because it's such a common theme uh, for us. Um, the healthcare system as we know it is unfortunately pretty fractured. There's a lot of different people involved. so. As they become your patients, you in some ways are the primary care doctors, they arrive in hospital, there's suddenly a whole new array of
people taking care of them, and trust is an issue. I, I think it can be bridged. I think it's bridged by communication. I'm often thinking as I see patients in hospital that they're looking out at us thinking we are all working together. I'm not certain that is always the case. I think we always can do better, but I, I think th this, uh, the service to the patient and giving one voice is, is the overriding principle that we should adhere to. Um, so here he is. He has this aforementioned deeply held desire not to be dead. Um, it wasn't clear to me how really well he understood what I was telling him in terms of what this meant with disease now spread throughout. Um, and I wasn't sure at all what he was uh, telling his family or, or, or his wife in this case. Um, this um, first point, I, I think, uh, became more and more apparent to me in my practice in palliative care that as you continue to care for these patients, in many ways, you become their primary care physicians. You are literally the, the, the best, most knowledgeable and most involved with their care. And to the extent that ultimately they may not have beneficial treatment, the idea that at some point you're not going to continue treatment um, may feel or may seem to you, I think, as human beings taking care of other human beings, that it could be abandonment. Um, I, I think um, that's real. Um, I, I think it needs to be acknowledged, and I think we, we, you work around that all the time, uh, but I, I, don't, I don't think it goes away. I don't think it'll ever go away. I, as a primary care doctor, had exactly the same ownership of my patients, of feeling like I, oh, I, they, I, I, their health care belonged in some way to me, and I couldn't let them down. Uh, in oncology, it, to some extent, I'm worried that uh, uh, continued chemotherapy may actually be the way that you show that you still care, and if you're not willing to continue chemo, for instance, it may be interpreted more by you or by the family or them that, that you don't care anymore. Obviously not true, but a, a, a common challenge. Um, I, I see in the hospital, uh, frankly, this, this image of once someone gets their hand caught in the door in the emergency room, they get dragged into the hospital and many things happen that are maybe unexpected, maybe unwelcome, maybe not even beneficial, but they're part of the medical you know, complex here at a hospital. Uh, uh, I worry um, that ultimately um, people keep doing uh, what they've been doing because they don't know what the alternative is and the alternative sounds worse than anything that you're going to throw me out on the street and, I, and then I'll die uncared for. So I think that the concept that at some point the alternatives to continued aggressive therapy have to be clearly stated what will that look like how will we continue to care for you? Uh, and that has to be supported, in my mind, by the oncology community as much as anybody. Uh, that's my job as a palliative care and ultimately as a hospice uh, referral to do that. But it, it has to come, uh, I think, uh, with permission from you all. So I would, I would, um, Think about this. How do you actually get into these conversations um, as you have so many uh, tasks in front of you in your uh, offices for care of these patients, uh, many boxes that need to be checked? Um, how are you going to uh, donate time to this, this aspect of oncology care? Um, I, I guess I did this in my geriatric practice, a variety of this anyway, wherein I had some 800 geriatric patients for years, and I made a mission to, to talk with all of them about their wishes. And over time, I was able to do it. I got it down to a reasonably short period of time, a short talk, seven minutes or thereabouts. And I thought, in general, all of my patients actually appreciated the fact that I was respectful to them. I brought up the idea of talking about their wishes, what they would want, uh, for themselves um, and that I would respect those wishes. Uh, so I, I put it this way, um, I would often say, well, if you fell over in the, in the giant parking lot and you were unconscious, who's going to show up 
you know, in the hospital to help us care for you, to make decisions for you if you are no longer able to. In our hospital setting, it's fairly common for our, our patients and, and advanced cancer patients to be pretty darn sick and not be very capable of directing care. So I, I think um, the question, who will do the talking, and then um, this question, uh, do they really know what you want? What would you expect? Again, I don't meet daughters who want to lose their mother, husbands who want to lose wives, um, but um, have they had a real conversation with that daughter or with that wife about what they would want depending on what the circumstances were, what their chances were, what survival would take and what it would mean. So um, I think um, advanced directives is not the thing that you're spending a lot of your daily time in, I think, in your oncology visits. But I think it is actually a good way to get into this topic and whether you do this or someone else in your office or you know, ultimately a palliative care uh, colleague or pro, uh, team working with you would get involved with this. Very briefly, because this topic sometimes gets a little um, vague to people, uh, when you think about advanced directives, there's actually two parts to an advanced directive. The first part, in my mind, is the most important part, this appointing of a health care agent. We used to call it power of attorney for health care, but that was a little confusing, so health care agent. The um, patients uh, can do this at the kitchen table. They can do this in your office. There, you, there's no requirement for a lawyer. There's no requirement for a notary. The patient has to tell us who they think would make the best uh, uh, decisions if they were unable, if the patient themselves were unable, who would be best able to carry out the patient's wishes. Um, and after they dis determine that, the document needs to be signed by the patient, capacitated patient, and then two witnesses over the age of 18. Anybody who is not the patient, who, the person who's being given authority, healthcare authority, can sign it. Healthcare professionals are often recommended not to do it. I don't usually do it. My social worker will do it, though, and other people in medical offices do it all the time. Appointment of a healthcare agent is what most people would say is the, the smartest one step we can take. And then the question is, have you told that person what you would really want given circumstances? So the second part of a healthcare, um, uh, 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 I'm sorry, an advanced directive would be the um, used to be called uh, living will. That also was confusing to people. It confused it with a financial will. So it's now been in the state of Maryland just called healthcare instructions. And that's the document that says, if I get in this shape, I would want that done. If I'm in a terminal condition, I would want X, Y, and Z. I'd want a feeding tube. I wouldn't want a feeding tube. If I'm in a vegetative state, if I am in an end stage condition, I would want to be on a ventilator or not on a ventilator. These are the type of issues that we're talking about. I often tell patients they don't need to fill that out for me. They use it as a template to talk with their loved ones. They can certainly fill it out and people have opinions about that. So these documents are widely available, state of Maryland version. There's a lot of other ones. People are familiar with one called Five Wishes, which is a little more patient friendly and easier for families to read through. And it talks about other kinds of preferences that patients and families uh, may want. So I, I bring this up because I think it is a way to start the topic with more seriously ill patients about their wishes. They, I think they get under between the lines why we are asking them these questions. And in my experience, it often leads then to real discussion about what things may be coming, what options are ahead of them, ones they may or may not choose. And therefore, I think the dialogue can be started. I, I don't always expect patients to arrive back at, the, at my office or your office with a completed advanced directive, although sometimes they will. But I think if we've allowed them to open up that conversation, you uh, may find that there's more questions coming your way and, and uh, allow us to, to talk more uh, uh, personally about what may be ahead of a patient for their medical oncological care in the future. Um, I um, have um, three questions that I'm often asking patients, again, as I'm hospital-based, that's where they tend to be, but I think they work everywhere, and I've, I, I, I recognize them to be 
simplistic appearing questions, but it turns out that generally I find out more than I ever think I'm going to by asking questions like this. So these are the questions that I often ask, um, and it's, it, it really is most commonly um, the second one, which is what are you worried about right now? I ask that in almost any interview where I see patients, they don't often really even know me at all. I can be a complete stranger, and yet they will answer that question. Sometimes, um, as we are human beings, we don't always trust the person who's talking with us so much yet. They might only give me part of an answer. Um, I have often found that um, what people say to me the first time I ask the question isn't the whole answer. So sometimes I, I would then, in this very brief interview, might suggest to them, tell me more about what you just said, and it's not uncommon for them to tell me something quite different than I thought they were telling me to begin with. So, for instance, I would say, what are you worried about? They say, well, uh, I'm worried about dying. I said, well, that, that, okay, that's pretty obvious. You've got, you know, I don't say it, but I'm thinking they've got advanced cancer. But then I say, well, tell me a little more. Why do you say that? They say, well, I'm not worried about dying now, but I'm worried about things that will happen down the road when I really am dying. So it allows you to kind of broaden the conversation. So I, I think uh, that a uh, very simple question of asking people what they're worried about now also allows you maybe to solve what seems, it may not be so esoteric or it may be existential as dying. It might be just something simple that can be solved. Like I'm worried about how I'm gonna get home after this visit or something more mundane that we can help and solve for our patients. So I, I, I think it's a good question. I think it works often well to get people to tell you what they're really thinking. The other question I will ask is what do you hope for and sometimes that sounds a little odd to a patient who may be seriously ill with a, with a serious diagnosis, but patients always do hope for something, and I, and I uh, sometimes you know, remind them, a miracle, sure. We're, we're in favor of miracles, not in charge of miracles. They're rare. Um, I, I say I'm often uh, uh, um, uh, challenged by that question. I, I've started to adopt this answer for religious people uh, who appeared in, in front of me often saying, I hope for a miracle, and I, I'd say for my mother, and I would say, well, you might want to consider you've already seen some of the miracle with her life, so I get out of it that way. However, um, I do say in case there isn't a miracle we have to plan for, so uh, can you tell me other things you hope for? And most people will say things you would expect. I hope I will not be miserable for whatever time I have. I hope my family's all right. Uh, I hope I'm maybe not in this hospital. Um, I hope I'm home. Those are common things. So typical for, for truly more seriously ill patients. Uh, however, I think it's even a question that can be asked earlier uh, and in, our, in our care of patients. Our fear is another one, and I do ask patients, are you afraid? And it's not uncommon for people to say, I'm not afraid if I die, then I'm, I'm gone, but I am afraid of what might happen to me along the way. And there is our opportunity. I say we will continue to care for you regardless with your oncologist to care for you in the best way we can for as long as you're here. So those are uh, common uh, questions that you might consider part. I um, now go just a little off the track. Um, I, I, many of you probably know me. I've been here for quite a long time. Uh, uh, Dr. Fowler and Dr. Farhar talked me into giving this talk, and I told them it may be the last time I talk because I'm likely to be leaving MedStar fairly soon, but I have to take the opportunity then to cast some philosophy upon you as well. And so this is um, stolen, like most of my information, uh, uh, which I always tell my residents, feel free to steal from me. Um, uh, Cassell. Uh, wrote about this, and he talked about suffering. And as oncologists and palliative care specialists, we are often involved with human suffering. So he wanted us to think about suffering in maybe in a little bit broader term. So he, he said um, he, he, he liked to think about personhood, whole person, thinking. 
And he said that the people who appear in front of us every day in our offices or in the hospital actually are quite complex and they have many facets. So all the people we see today come to us from a past. They, they have a history that is ingrained. Um, it guides uh, how they're going likely into the future. Part of that may be their experience with their own uh, previous illness, maybe even a previous cancer that they beat. Or maybe it was a previous illness from their family of cancer where th this or that happened. So it informs how they think, how they, how they proceed uh, in, in many ways. These um, same um, patients have their family, as we well know, uh, for better or for worse, um, and however they define their family, uh, as we also know, is who their family may be. So um, these are uh, very important people to them and ultimately to us when we're caring for these people. They come typically from a cultural background, which also shades how they view illness, how they view uh, 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 treatment, uh, how we speak to one another. All things are dictated in many ways by culture, and we are now obviously in a multicultural world. These patients, uh, uh, like us, have roles. Uh, we on this uh, talk today are healthcare providers. We're doctors, or we are uh, uh, nurses and nurse practitioners. We, we, we see our, li our, our, our lives that way. We, that's how we work uh, our, our uh, interpretation of the world. Um, we all have a very distinct relationship to ourselves. It started a long time ago. We, um, we have to look in the mirror. We have to um, uh, uh, believe we're being ourselves, true to ourselves. We, maybe even more now, are political beings um, we are somehow involved, it could be in our hospital, in our office, in our community, it could be national. Um, we, we have lives and, and things that worry us or inspire us. We have a life that is unconscious, that, that travels somehow below the surface, but as we all know, very much affects us even if we're not aware of it. We have adopted behaviors, things that we just like to do. Uh, you like to have your coffee in the morning. You like to get up and, and run around the block to get wake up. Th those are important behaviors that we think are, are integral you know, to our health and to, to our daily worlds. Um, we have a physical body that we have always depended on. It is our vessel to get about the world and do our, the things th that we need to do. We depend on our body. We have secret lives. Um, this is um, uh, not necessarily going to show up in front of us uh, healthcare providers. Uh, however, it is possible when people are more seriously ill that secret lives start to become less secret. Um, so they exist for everyone and, are, and can be a real factor. And finally, all, all people have some form of a spiritual life that guides them in our world. We hope it's still supporting them when other things become more difficult. So I, um, the, the, the question or the, the issue that Cassell uh, uh, brings up is that he, he postulates that suffering is caused by the disintegration of the person. The, the, um, the fact that the personhood comes under attack is what causes suffer, human suffering. So when you um, become a person who um, no longer can be active in any kind of political uh, life, you, you have started uh, to, to lose a little bit. Your um, behaviors, your, 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 your common practices, uh, uh, suddenly they're not so easy for you to accomplish, so you, you lose them. Uh, they, they become a, a loss. You uh, a role. Uh, I'm a doctor. If I can no longer practice medicine or, or take care of patients, I'm diminished. Um, if I'm a father and can't take, help my children, if I'm a husband and, and can't act as a husband, I, I'm diminished. I, 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 I am losing uh, uh, ground and, and I suffer for, suffer for that. My body, I've trusted all along, is now in cancer, for instance, under full attack. 
um, the things I used to trust aren't working anymore or betraying uh, me, the things that are uh, important in my background, my cultural background are, are starting to fade uh, because I'm starting to be overwhelmed by that. So as you see, each one of our personhood uh, aspects starts to come apart, secret lives. So the, the point that Cassell would want us to think about, and the reason I'm bringing it up to all of you in your more philosophic moments is that because all our patients are undergoing a type of disintegration of their personhood, the remedy for some of that suffering is reintegration. So how do our patients reintegrate or salvage the, the remaining parts into an integral human being and therefore are able to continue on with their lives? I don't think any one of us can do this for one patient, but I think we can be aware of what's happening and we can call on others to help us. We are um, uh, uh, multidisciplinary in palliative care, so a, uh, a social worker, as you well know with your navigators, the social worker is so important. Spiritual care, very important for the seriously ill. Uh, we like our pharmacists because they help us with medications when they are part of the, the suffering continuum. So I, I bring up this last point uh, just because I always uh, like to say to families who are really seriously uh, 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 grieving or uh, 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 anticipating what is going to happen, that in my world there's still time. There's still time to talk with your loved one, and there are five things that are always recommended that we should, if we give our patients, our families, a chance to say to one another, it's a gift. And so those things are often in some any order Thank you for all that you have done for me as my mother. Thank you as, as my wife. Forgive me for when I was not a perfect husband or perfect father. Few of us are. I forgive you when you were not perfect. These first three are very important in my mind and, and very difficult because a lot of challenges revolve around human interactions with these issues. Uh, give someone an opportunity to say uh, is something as important as I love you. And finally, for those who, who can do this, the idea of saying goodbye to someone who they may never see again is in some ways a gift as far as I'm concerned. Thank you for the opportunity to talk today. Uh, please um, uh, do, do your, continue your best work as you have been doing, and I hope my palliative colleagues will continue to support you in all of that work.